now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Mr. Nesbitt. Thank you, Principal uh, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister if he's satisfied with the current arrangements uh, for consulting with the families of murder victims uh, with regard to the release on licence of perpetrators uh, released on licence by parole commissioners? Well, there's a complex set of arrangements uh, which have uh, ma managed through the uh, Victims Information Scheme, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I believe that those normally work extremely well in ensuring that families are made aware as uh, individuals progress through the system and particularly in terms of looking at issues like temporary release uh, but there are always circumstances in which in some cases uh, the information is perhaps not supplied in a way which has been most helpful and that's an issue which has been currently addressed within the department i call mr nesbitt for supplementary Thank you very much. I'm afraid the Minister's words are probably of little comfort to people like Linda Brown, whose daughter Nicola Dixon was murdered in Ballycarry in 2003, and Linda only discovering that the perpetrator uh, was out on licence by being told that he'd been spotted uh, out and about uh, in the centre of Belfast. So can the Minister expand on what he is doing, and particularly whether he'll uh, catch up with England and Wales in terms of the Euro Directive on the rights of victims and allow victims to participate in parole hearings? Well, the issue of direct participation by victims in parole hearings is in a different stage. Certainly, uh, Mr. Nesbitt has highlighted one particular issue where there was a problem in that the way the information was supplied around somebody on the third phase of the pre-release scheme was perhaps supplied in a way which was not entirely uh, easy to understand, and that's the point which I referred to my principal answer about ensuring that matters are dealt with differently. But clearly, this is the kind of an issue which needs to be kept under review as part of the ongoing work with victims and witnesses to ensure uh, that, for example, the joined up uh, issues around the bringing together the three victim information schemes is done in the best possible way to assist uh, victims, whether they be direct victims or those who are bereaved through murder or manslaughter. Call Mr. Alec Maskey. Could I ask the Minister, uh, could he advise the House what options were explored by his department or himself with the PSNI as uh, alternatives, if you like, to the issue of yet another direct award contract to graft and recruitment for the agency staff at the end of this year? Uh, well, I can answer to, uh, to Mr. Maskey that unless there is an issue about the department having a formal role of approving a business case because of the fi figures involved, the issue of direct award contracts is an issue for the PSNI uh, to carry out. It is not an issue for the department to directly supervise. Mr. Maskey for supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. Uh, can I note, first of all, that before I last supplementary, it's very interesting that the Minister will routinely take this approach to every organisation with the exception of the so-called National Crime Agency, but notwithstanding that, given the, uh, the ongoing controversy around this lucrative yet non-competitive contract, would the Minister assure this House that his uh, Permanent Secretary will not endorse this particular contract? Well, I can give Mr Maskey and the House an assurance uh, that the correct procedures will be followed by the Department, by the Minister and by the Permanent Secretary. If there is a role for the Minister, it will be carried out properly. If there is a role for the Permanent Secretary, it will be carried out properly. Yeah, and I call Mr Mervyn's story. Thank you, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker. Can I ask the, the Justice Minister what progress is being made uh, to ensure that Northern Ireland plays its full part in regards to the National Crime Agency? And rather than having the continual platitudes in this House about trying to go after uh, people who break the law, that when we have the opportunity actually to deal with lawbreakers and bring them to a system whereby they are accountable for their deeds and their ill-gotten gain, uh, is actually something of reality rather than just words? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I've certainly told the House on a number of occasions about the engagement which I've had around the National Crime Agency. Um, I continue to believe it's vitally important that we get the full benefits of having the NCA operational in Northern Ireland in the devolved sphere, as well as, of course, its current position active in the non-devolved sphere without any oversight from the policing architecture that we have. Um, in the latter part of October, um, indeed on the 25th of October, uh, I wrote to Sinn Féin members um, setting out some responses to questions which had been raised. And on the 22nd of October, 
Um, I was given an undertaking by members of the SDLP uh, to provide me with a paper setting out some of the concerns they have. I remain active and keen to engage around those issues, but at the moment, the ball is respectively in the, you know, in the court of those two parties and not with the department. I can assure the House in general that the department will respond speedily to any representations made by any party in the House. I call Mr Mervyn Story for a supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister for clarifying that and obviously it will now be interesting to see what the response of those two parties that talk much about dealing with those who are lawbreakers are at you prepared to come up with uh, suggestions as to how this vitally important element of uh, our structures against criminality and criminals is implemented. But can, could the Minister uh, give the assurance to the House that it won't just be around the issues of accountability that will be addressed, but it will be real meaningful progress to ensure that Northern Ireland plays its central role in this very important issue to ensure that criminals and their assets are pursued and put out of business. But certainly, Principal Deputy Speaker, that is my intention to ensure that we have the National Crime Agency operating in every respect in Northern Ireland in support of the PSNI and other agencies, <coughs> playing its part in the Organised Crime Task Force alongside other agencies, whether local and devolved or UK-wide agencies operating in Northern Ireland. I believe that should be the ambition for all of us. That has to be done in recognition of the specific policing architecture we have in Northern Ireland, as I've said on many occasions, both in this House and in negotiations with Whitehall ministers. I remain committed to seeing that happen. I welcome the fact that I have had uh, positive comments on that from all parties in this House, and I just hope that we can carry it through and get the details sorted out from those who are currently you know, asking questions but haven't responded to the last points I put back to them. I trust that we can do that as speedily as possible. Thank you, and I call Mr Sidney Anderson. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for his assessment of the high levels of sick leave within his department and within the Northern Ireland Prison Service? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, Mr Anderson correctly highlights why sick leave is seen as at a high level uh, within the DOJ, because prison officers are classed as departmental employees in terms of the way the statistics are produced. And I think we could all accept that there are circumstances in which somebody who has a relatively straightforward uh, desk-bound policy job might be able to go to work when, with a similar sickness, uh, they would be unable to work as a prison officer. That is a large part of why, in fact, that's probably the almost total part of why DOJ uh, absentee figures are higher than the civil service average. It is an issue which is being addressed both in the core department as in other departments and within the prison service itself. But we do have to recognize the circumstances under which prison officers work and accept that their rate of sickness will always be higher than for other staff. Mr. Anderson for a supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the, the Minister for, for his response. Uh, Minister, I understand uh, that the Northern Ireland Prison Service predicts a further increase uh, in sick leave in 2013-14. Would you agree with me that sick uh, leave levels are being made worse by the low staff morale at present time caused by the speed and nature of the current prison reform programme? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I have no sign that there is low staff morale because of the prison reform programme. Indeed, what I see is with a significant uh, input of new staff, over 300 new staff who've joined the service, 200 staff who have been regraded uh, into the new custody officer post, that there is a significant impetus to see change happening within the prison service. There are undoubtedly some members who were more accustomed to the difficult duties they had to perform some years ago, for whom that is a challenge. But what I see is significant improvement being made and a solid management leadership, which is driving forward the change that this society needs to see. Colin Eastwood. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the, the Minister if he's aware of the concern um, that, the, that the review in terms of the, the fees for, for solicitors around family law and the reduction, um, is he aware of the concern that that might lead to uh, the closure of some uh, law practices and then subsequently uh, potentially uh, difficulties around access to justice for some people? Well, certainly I am aware that concerns have been expressed by some people of the potential for closure of solicitors' firms. But the reality is I have a duty to ensure that the budget which the Department of Justice has is used to provide the justice services this society needs as a whole. 
Uh, in round figures on devolution, the justice budget was £75 million and expenditure was just over 100. Despite the reforms that have been made to the criminal uh, fees, the, bud the budget at £75 million is still being exceeded with expenditure in the region of £100 million. And every penny which is spent in that respect is money which is not being directed uh, to other services by the Department. When we look at the comparison between fees as they are in this jurisdiction with England and Wales, the most comparable figure, we are spending significantly more on those fees within this jurisdiction, and there is no doubt that that position is unsustainable into the future. Well, Mr. Eastwood for a supplementary. Thank you, and thank the Minister for his answer. Um, given the real difficulty that law graduates have in terms of finding employment or finding placement in solicitor's office, some people would say because of some of these cuts, um, would the Minister advise young people to go into the legal profession? Well, it's not for me to advise young people on their career choices, except possibly the four uh, young adults who are my children. Um, the, the issue has to be that individuals have to decide for themselves, and there's no doubt that some law graduates have found uh, career opportunities with some of the international legal firms which are now establishing back office services in Northern Ireland. But the reality is uh, other aspects of life have changed in recent years, and I'm not sure that it's my position as Justice Minister to guarantee that small solicitors' firms will continue to operate as they have. What I do also see is a number of lawyers, both solicitors and barristers, looking at different ways in which they could operate, for example, developing alternative dispute resolution services. And the important thing is to see that we get the best possible services for the people of Northern Ireland in an, info, uh, uh, an affordable way and which meets the needs of this society for the next few years. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, given the concerns highlighted by the Public Accounts Committee regarding the awarding of the contract and the way in which it was carried out with respect to the theatre, have you any concerns about the proposals, um, given the fact that the preferred bidder or bidder designate for the Desert Creek College may be the same company? Well, there is not, as I understand it at this stage, Principal Deputy Speaker, either a preferred bidder or a preferred bidder designate. Um, it is certainly my information uh, from the work being done by the program board that robust checks have been carried out on the bidders who might be involved in the final contract. And indeed, the, uh, the COPE within DHSSPS has been carrying out a lot of that work on behalf of the program board. The, you know, the key issue is to ensure that we get Desert Creek College built as fast as possible and meeting the needs of the three services. Thank you, and I call Mr Copeland for a supplementary. Uh, 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 thank you very much. Um, uh, my source of information for that minister was the Justice Committee, where I believe some of your own departmental officials used the term last week. However, given the significant amount of uh, budget overspends that have uh, dogged um, Desert Creek thus far, do you feel that this has a potential to provide further delay and the steps you take to prevent that? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I believe we have now got matters back on track. There certainly was a problem um, in that the consultants appointed uh, made a very significant error in the estimated costs, and those who were supervising failed to pick up on that error. Um, a lot of work has been done by the programme team, by the two departments, by the three responsible bodies, to look at uh, how costs can be taken out without cutting back on the functionality of the college, and I believe we've now reached that position that we have a scheme which will represent value for money and which can go ahead. I call Mr Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, in light, particularly in light of recent events, uh, for his assessment of the current threat posed by dissident Republican terrorists? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, the position remains, as it has been for some time, that the threat from Republican terrorists remains severe which means that attacks are believed to be likely, and clearly we have seen a number of significant attacks in recent weeks. Uh, certainly the uh, use of parcel bombs, which put at risk the lives of a number of people, whoever they may have had uh, addresses to, they were clearly never going to reach the individuals to whom they were addressed, but putting at lives the threat of postal workers and administrative staff and a variety of uh, government and police officers uh, just shows how desperate some people are. The deliberate attempt to murder police officers in Straban this weekend was clearly a sign showing that that threat is being carried through. 
But what we should also recognise is the extremely good work being done by the PSNI, whether in some of the specialist branches or at community level, in countering that threat. Order, and that ends the, uh, the period for topical questions. The Minister of Justice, we must now move on.